So, colleagues, we begin with the ancient Greeks. Now, let me warn you, the ancient Greeks are not rocket science. Ancient Greeks are harder than rocket science. And from past experience, I know that these first topics are the most challenging for students. So, um, ancient Greeks are an entirely different culture, it's Greek language, terms in Greek. There are many different names which are hard to remember. For many students hear them for the first time. Um, and uh, uh, in general, again, I hope that if you find these topics interesting, you will pursue them uh, at great length um, on your own pace. However, I want to try uh, uh, to give you at least a basic rundown of the, of the main ideas, of the main takeaway points. So, the sophists is a collective umbrella term um, for, largely speaking, associated with a group of itinerant teachers of rhetoric in the uh, um, 5th century BCE ancient Greece. So we're talking about 5th century BCE. Um, now, they didn't really form any kind of coherent school, so it's more of an exonym. It's a, it's a name that was given to the sophists largely by their detractors. So, first of all, we should take everything we know about the sophists with a grain of salt, because by and large, the tradition that preserved ideas about the sophists was hostile to the sophists. It's the first reason to take it with a grain of salt. And um, secondly, um, the, the sophists were individual thinkers. And their works, by the way, are mostly lost, so we have to do a bit of an imaginative reconstruction. But still, they are individual thinkers with individual thoughts. So, in many ways, they don't necessarily agree with one another. Now, let's try, as concisely as possible, to understand what are the main takeaway points. So, the sophistic movement begins against the background of, I suppose, uh, two historical circumstances, or two historical phenomena. One is travel, and the other is war. Um, war and the breakdown of civil order. So what happens is that, as these teachers of rhetoric, for political, social, economic reasons we don't have time to go into, begin to travel around Greece and outside of Greece, they notice, first and foremost, that there's an interesting distinction between the laws of nature Physis, and the laws, norms, and conventions of society, in Greek known as nomos, or the nomoi, the laws, right? And the contrast is simple. Nature seems to be the same everywhere. The sun always rises in the east. Uh, all humans breathe through their nostrils. All humans uh, cry when they are sad and laugh when they are happy. But the, the customs, the laws of each society, tends to be different, sometimes in very, very radical ways. It's an interesting uh, uh, example um, given by Herodotus when the Persian king summons to his court the um, representatives of the Greeks and the representatives of, the per of some Indian tribe under his control. And uh, through an interpreter, through a translator, he makes the exchange intelligible to both parties, both to the Persians and to the Greeks. And basically, he asks to the Greeks, if their parents die, if their father dies, let's say, what would they take, what could motivate them, money or maybe some kind of promotion, to eat the body of their dead parent? And the Greeks are utterly horrified. And they say they would not do such a dreadful thing for any money in the world. Now. He asks, the Persian king, through an interpreter, asks the same question to, to the Indian tribe. And the point is that, the Indi for, the, for this particular Indian tribe, this is exactly what they do with their dead parents. They cannibalize them. This is the normal thing to do in their society. And for them, that is absolutely perfectly normal. They don't need to be incentivized or motivated. That's what they do naturally. And then, the Persian king flips the question. And he asks the Greeks about the cremation, which was the normal custom for the Greeks. And then he asks about the cremation of the Indians, and the Indians are horrified at the prospects of burning the 
bodies of their dead parents, and they are as horrified at this prospect as the Greeks are horrified at the prospect of eating, of cannibalizing their dead parents. Right? And Herodotus concludes from this by quoting Greek poet Pindar. He says, Nomos is king. Nomos is king. That um, even when exposed to different traditions, human beings, most human beings in our local narrow-mindedness, even when we are, even if even when we are aware that there are, as a matter of fact, different customs, still we think that our customs are somehow true uh, or, or best or, or the only possible. So, um, basically, another way of phrasing this issue is that we are talking about relativism, right? And relativism is a broad philosophical concept. Um, uh, we can talk about three distinct meanings. So first, let's start with the factual relativism. So factual relativism, the idea is that as a matter of fact, different societies have different values. Um, let's take an example closer to home. Um, ancient societies, including Greek societies, practiced slavery and thought that slavery was normal and maybe even natural. Right? We tend to not think in these terms today. Right? So as a matter of fact, we see that laws, customs, and traditions differ from place to place, and in the same place differ from time to time. By the way, a very important, uh, I feel, lesson in <laughs> open-mindedness is that, what you know, let's ask ourselves, what would the future generations think about us? What would the future generations think about our contemporary customs, of custom, customs of you and me? You know, we tend to think of ancient practice of slavery as barbaric. Could it be that much of what we do would be regarded as barbaric by future generations. I'm reminded of uh, uh, Hannah Arendt's famous discussion of the banality of evil, right? So this is factual relativism. In addition to factual relativism, you could go one step further and say, not only is it the case that customs are different, but in fact, they are essentially uh, uh, different in the sense that ontologically different, that there is no fact of the matter. That there is no right custom. Yes, they are different, and none, none is the right one. Right? And um, I suppose as a, as a species of this, as a variant of this, you could talk about social relativism, saying that um, what the, the, the meaning of the phrase, good or evil, the meaning of the phrase right and wrong, is actually set by the dynamic, group dynamic, of a particular community. That a particular community decides what is right and what is wrong. And in addition to this decision, there's, there is no fact of the matter. So, what are the political philosophical implications of this observed factual relativism? Well, broadly speaking, the most important issue that is raised is the notion of justice. Again, the traditional unreflective view tends to see social norms of justice as unproblematic. Uh, very often, these norms would be associated with uh, uh, the will of the gods. So, in the case of the ancient Greeks, we're talking about the Olympian gods, for example, Zeus. But this will find different expression, of course, in uh, uh, later monotheistic traditions. So, it is possible, but difficult, to go back to this maybe somewhat naive view of the world, uh, pre-relativist view of the world, saying that no, even though customs are different, still there's one divine order and human beings obey this one divine order. Not to mention that when we try to um, put philosophy and religion into dialogue with one another, it's a complicated and controversial story, we run into the uh, observed problem of evil and the problem of evil um, basically says that, okay, let's imagine that uh, the laws of justice are ordained by the gods. Do the gods actually oversee that justice is always done? And the answer seems to be most of the time, no, not really. Very often we observe that crime does indeed pay individuals do end up breaking the law and getting away with it. And sometimes on a social level, you can see uh, um, tyrannical invaders uh, assaulting innocent cities, t 
turning formerly free people into slaves, and again, also seemingly getting away with it, right? So I'm not saying that it's an insolvable problem, but it's definitely, definitely an interesting issue to ponder, the problem of evil. And uh, um, often professors of philosophy discussing this subject um, seem to act on the presupposition that the problem of evil must have a solution. There must be a simple and straightforward or, or some sort of a solution to the problem of evil. But we should be open to the possibility, and certainly the sophists were open to the possibility, that there is no solution to the problem of evil. That in fact, this world is not a divinely ordered cosmos, but actually chaos, right? In the words of Immanuel Kant, the Schlund, the Zwecklosen Chaos der Materie, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, right? And gods either don't exist or don't care about us. So if we take gods out of the picture, what can justice be? Well, it seems that we go back to our previous um, possibilities, conflict and consensus, conflict and consensus. The conflictual side would say that justice is simply a mask for the interests of the stronger, right? So either we're talking about class oppression, a ruling party imposing their will on the rest of the population. Or maybe, and even, even more broadly, the domination of individual by society. It's a conflictual view of social relation. On the other hand, we can hope that maybe actually no. Maybe there is a natural harmony of interest of the individual and society. And in fact, ultimately, human beings can only become properly human and properly happy in a society. This would be the best possible consensual view. Or a, a, a second option, lesser option, is that, yeah, society is not perfectly consensual, but still social arrangements represent a kind of a compromise. So not really natural harmony, but so to speak, necessary evil, or at least lesser of two evils. And these are the possibilities on the table, and they were discussed actively by the most prominent members of the sophistic tradition. So before we proceed, let us talk about the potential political implications of uh, this dichotomy between conflict and consensus. So clearly, philosophers who tend to view society in a consensual fashion, naturally, are going to be leaning towards some sort of a conservative political program. If society is good, one should avoid uh, uh, changing it, changing it potentially for the worse. On the other hand, kind of a halfway house between conflict and consensus would be the ideas of reform. That maybe our society is conflictual now, but there are possible reforms that could make it more consensual. We are somewhere in between. The third option is to say no. Our society is so radically bad, is so radically conflictual, that only a violent revolution can solve uh, uh, the issues. And then, logically speaking, there's also a fourth possibility, also on the conflict side. So this is uh, um, potentially from the most consensual to the most conflictual. This idea of an individual private project, and we will see this in some of the sophists, in fact, that Social life is so bad beyond redemption that even revolution has no chance of bringing true harmony to society. So the only way that human beings can be properly human and properly happy is actually by constantly struggling against society, constantly fighting, fighting against society, in fact, right? It's the idea of an individual private project. Um, now, to be fair, this project could be more or less conflictual, that's, uh, uh, that's a separate point, but it's, it's always there as an anti-political solution, so to speak, to the problem of politics. Basically, the admission that politics cannot realistically be expected to, be, to solve our problems, and therefore, uh, um, we have to seek our own self-realization in private life. 